And with that, I will welcome everybody to this next webinar in OISE and TDSB's uh, Toronto District School Board's uh, long-standing series now of webinars that are focused on different aspects of environmental and sustainability education, including climate change education. My name is Hilary Inwood, and I'm the uh, coordinator of the Sustainability and Climate Action Network at OISE. And I'm very pleased to uh, welcome one of my fellow instructors from OISE to, uh, as one of our speakers for today. Um, you are in a session called Teaching Climate Change by Actively Empowering Learners in a Warming World. And we're very happy to be welcoming uh, two presenters that are doing work with Learning for Sustainable Future, uh, an amazing NGO that works across Canada um, here in, um, but, but is, is focused, uh, centered here in Toronto. And we're always happy to be doing work with our friends from LSF. Um, there is an entrance poll if you're just coming to join us now. So we ask you to uh, fill that out. It just gives us a little bit of information about who is in the room with us today. Um, with that in mind, this is what you can expect over the next hour. We will have a, a, a welcome to all of you. Bienvenue and uh, bonjour. Uh, and I'll, of course, a land acknowledgement to begin. Um, and um, then we're going to, um, I will introduce Karen and Jen, our two presenters for today's session. And then we'll finish up at the end, just talking a little bit about some of the upcoming webinars. We seem to always have more upcoming webinars than <laughs> we do before the holidays hit in December. So we'll introduce you to those and talk a little bit more about what will happen in January. So with that in mind, um, I will I'll move on to the land acknowledgement. And I'd like to introduce you to the work of Ange Loft. And Ange is um, of special interest to us um, as an Indigenous artist. We often have had Indigenous artworks, by the way, accompany the land acknowledgement as part of this series. And Ange is, uh, in fact, um, an artist in residence, an Indigenous artist in residence at OISE this year and has been actually for a couple of years. So it was a, we're well overdue in terms of introducing you to Ange's um, multidisciplinary work. Um, Ange is an interdisciplinary performing artist and um, uh, initiator from Gadanakwe. Uh, Kananhaka territory, uh, but she works in Toronto. She's currently, as I said, an artist in residence at, uh, at OISE. She's an ardent collaborator, consultant, facilitator, and mentor, working in story weaving, arts-based research, wearable sculpture, and focuses on Haudenosaunee history. She's an associate artistic director of Jumbly's Theatre, where she directs the Talking Treaties Initiative. You're seeing a compilation of images associated with the Talking Tree uh, Treaties project which artfully shares local Indigenous history and awareness. Since 2015, symbols and stories of agreement making were gathered through interview, audio gallery, dance, choral compositions, uh, spectacle, and art space research in Toronto. And the project has resulted in the Talking Treaties Spectacle, which is an ongoing legacy of uh, creative learning activities that come from it. So with that, we acknowledge that we're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas, of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit people. And we also will recognize that you know, land acknowledgements are contentious these days, um, but we feel it's always important to center Indigenous voices at the start of these uh, webinars that deal with uh, the climate crisis uh, and how we are using education as a way to bring up change in regards to it. And um, uh, with that in mind, we encourage all of you to not only listen to the acknowledgements, but figure out how you can enact this work in your own professional and personal lives. So with that in mind, I would like to introduce you to our two presenters today. I'm very pleased to welcome Karen Acton. I've had um, really uh, the um, great benefit of knowing Karen for a number of years and have been so impressed with the work that she's done as an educator. She's got over 30 years of experience in both elementary and secondary panels as a science teacher, as a department head, as a principal and as a Ministry of Education officer. Um, and I, if I'm remembering correctly, Karen, I think when you and I first met, you were sustainably lead at your school board at that point in time too. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, so you, you've done it all. You really have an education. Um, <laughs> she subsequently has used her knowledge of passion and skills in the area of environmental education to accept a unique five-year position as a board level sustainability uh, lead principal. And uh, she's currently an assistant professor at Boise UT, uh, which is my own home institution, and she consults for learning for sustainable future as well. So I'm not sure how you do all of that and still sleep, Karen, but um, <laughs> we're happy to welcome you here while you're awake today. <laughs> Thank you. And Jen, also a pleasure to have you here from LSF. She's the manager of um, learning, research, and communication at Learning for Sustainable for Future. She's a master's of child study and education from, oh, wait for it, Boise at the University of Toronto. We're happy to have you back as an alumni, Jen. 
and she's worked to uh, empower youth in various capacities through her previous work as the membership chair for the OISE branch of the Council for Exceptional Children, uh, a respite camp leader at Holland uh, Bloorview Children's um, Rehabilitation Hospital, and as an academic interventionist uh, for learning different. So welcome, Jen, and welcome, Karen. Well, thanks very much. Should I share my screen and we can get started? And uh, I'm going to warn everybody, this is an interactive session. So um, there's a, a shared Google slide deck that we're going to get you working on just shortly here. Okay. So does everybody see the first slide, which is just basically the title? Perfect. Yeah. All right. So we are going to be talking a lot about empowering leaders in a warming, learners in a warming world. And I'm going to pass it off to Jen so she can get us started. Perfect. Thanks, Karen. And thanks, Hillary, for those introductions. So we will uh, start off by just showing you a roadmap of what we're going to go over this afternoon. So our agenda for this workshop is we're going to begin by what prompted the development of this climate change resource and why we chose an inquiry approach when writing it. And then we'll provide an overview of some of the essential components of this inquiry guide, including uh, the pedagogy, the themes that we're, we explore throughout. And then the main part of the session involves delving deeper into some of the active learning strategies that are woven throughout the inquiry guide in different chapters. And just to note that we will save time at the end for questions and know that we are making this uh, slide deck available to the participants here today. All right, so let's start with why this specific resource that we're sharing with you today. And when we were just chatting a moment ago, we did say it was uh, grade seven to 12, but it is definitely scalable um, to, uh, to younger grades as well. So I, I just put this slide in there, why this resource, I, I mean, you have to say it, it's because climate change is the most complex and wide reaching challenge facing humankind today. Um, I mean, UNESCO is all on top of it. They, they've got that, uh, their initiative of climate change education for sustainable development happening. And of course we know the IPCC report tells us that we're in a code red for humanity. So if anything, this guide is, is driven by what is happening to us globally. Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna do some interaction here with, um, with you. And to get you started on understanding how to use the shared Google Slides, I'm starting with a simple question. And a lot of you have done things like Jamboard. So the first slide that you're gonna go to is gonna be slide three. And Jen, did you paste the URL into the chat? Okay, so you can either just uh, copy it by taking a look at it and typing, or you can just, oftentimes if you just click on the link in the chat, it will take you directly there and find slide three and click on a sticky and just answer the question, what is your one greatest concern about incorporating climate change issues into your teaching? It doesn't matter what level, doesn't matter what grade, what do you find is your one greatest concern? If you've got two, we have enough room on the stickies that you can click on a second sticky and add a second response to. All right, so I'm gonna see, okay, so we have, good. You can always tell how many people are finding the site because you guys are all really, really interesting little animals, everything from the, the anonymous buffalo to chipmunk to beaver to cheetah to dinosaur. So we, <laughs> so we have lots. So I'm gonna give you just one minute of silence so you can click on a sticky and what's your one greatest concern? All right, and I'm gonna warn you now that what I would usually do in a normal situation is I talk about what the responses are on the slide. But if I were to do that right now in today's presentation, I would be giving away um, something that we're going to be working on in just a few minutes as one of the, the um, different kinds of active learning strategies we're gonna take you through that are in the guide. So you can just finish typing up there and we're gonna go back to slide three momentarily, but for now, let's just put a pin on that. All right. So um, empowering learners in a warming world. Uh, you can see there that there is a PDF version that you can go to. You can also click on the link and it will take you to an online version of it. Why did we create it? Well, the LSF did a survey and we're gonna talk about the survey again at the very end because it's gonna be redone. It's been a number of years since this survey went out. And what did we find? We found that less than half of the educators across Canada felt they had the knowledge and skills to teach climate change because they didn't have the PD, they didn't have resources, they didn't have up-to-date information. 
Um, and that's a problem because the survey also showed that half the students didn't pass the climate change knowledge test. So there is a real need for climate change guides. And Hillary just shared for me the little secret that the TDSB is also going to come up with something. So this is great that there are now guides being developed by educators, by, by licensed teachers that understand what kinds of guides that, that should be coming out. So this will be a great tool for, for people. Um, so this, the design of this guide is a little bit different than a lot of the resources that you're going to find, and it's because we focused on transformative learning and transformative pedagogy. So it's not just student centered, but it's all about this active learning inquiry based type of pedagogy, because when you teach climate change, it's not like you just want to have these little vessels where they're going to be, you know, filled with the knowledge from the teacher. Climate change is a very complex and nuanced topic. It's political, it's, um, there's controversy. Um, some of the things I noticed you're talking about in the stickies that there's that eco anxiety component. So you have to move from that traditional teacher, sage on stage, giving people knowledge. You have to move from that type of teaching to a transformative way of teaching. Um, where it's more about the student doing critical thinking, empowering themselves to, to understand the concepts, and then to be motivated to do something about it. So that is the premise of the guide. And because I love this, uh, so I've got the, um, when you get the slide deck, you'll see that there's live links here. So if you like this little graphic that I found, um, it came from teachthought.com. I love this because the guide is really focused on inquiry-based learning and a lot of teachers just like to have a little handy, uh, little justification for why it is they are teaching in a certain kind of methodology and inquiry-based learning is something that has come out for quite some time, but there's a lot of teachers hesitant and concerned about teaching it, but there are so many benefits, benefits to it. So here's just a little something for you to take, take away with you. All right, so the essential components of the guide. Okay, so this guide follows eight different lines of inquiry that are thematically focused. So when you go to the website, you can find the entire guide online uh, and you can also download the full guide, but you could also break it down by chapter and download each individual chapter as a PDF. So the eight thematic inquiries or chapters are all different. We start with what is climate change and why care and move through to where are we now, which is kind of a policy focus, and then how to use the Climate Atlas of Canada, which is a tool that is really helpful to stay on top of current data. If you haven't heard of it, it's an amazing uh, tool that I encourage you to check out. The guide also covers economic impacts, health uh, impacts, mental and physical and risks, and then finishes with the focus on the ever important Indigenous perspectives and ethical dimensions of climate change. And then finally, chapter nine is all about youth agency and goes through the steps for how to support students with taking on action projects in the classroom. So inquiries one to eight are designed to stand alone, addressing the different angles and lenses through which climate change can be explored in the classroom. And we added an extra section to the start of each chapter called essential background information for the teacher. So this way educators can get a brief backgrounder on key knowledge uh, that you need in order to teach the topic with embedded links and resources if you want to delve a little bit deeper. And then woven throughout each inquiry are lists of possible resources, including books and videos, and also hands-on activities to pursue learning with your students in the classroom. So in this presentation, we'll take you through the remaining essential components um, of the guide, as you can see on this slide, and we'll have you actively participate in specific activities in the six stages of the inquiry process and show you innovative assessment strategies and finally um, help you show, show you how you can help your students take action in the classroom. All right, so we're getting into the heart, the heart of the presentation. It's all about the inquiry and active learning strategies now. Okay, so here's a sample chapter. Um, it's the first one, inquiry number one, what is climate change and why care? And you'll see, as Jen just said, that we're following the six stages of the inquiry process. So every chapter will have the main heading and we'll have the activities nested underneath it. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take you through um, samples of what you will find in the guide to kind of help you understand how to use the guide and what some of the interactive strategies might be. So we're gonna start then with provocations. 
So we're going to actually do two provocations with you. And the first, like I promised, uh, takes us back to that slide that I had you answer what your biggest concern is when you teach climate change. And we're going to do something with it called affinity mapping. And a lot of you might be familiar with this because you might do it in the classroom uh, in, in a face-to-face -face situation where you actually use the stickies. But I'm going to show you how you can do it on an online format as well, um, where you go back to slide number three and then you take a look at the next slide, uh, actually slide number five. So in a classroom, you would see that you can do the stickies and you can arrange them. Uh, and I chose this photo, I don't know who did this, but because they use the nice deep red uh, theme stickies. And that's what I've got for you in slide number five. So go back to slide three and review all of the stickies and see if you can come up with what you think the main themes are that came up when it came to people's concerns. So just go right to slide five and then just type in what you think a theme might be. Um, take a look first to see if someone else has typed that in already. You can either add to that as well. Let's see how many different themes we get from the slides. Interesting. Hillary, I've not heard eco grief before. I mean, eco anxiety and, and that sort of thing, but eco grief, it's, I think it takes it up a notch, don't you? Yeah, and I have to admit that that is a term that's floating around in a lot of circles these days. Yeah, yeah, that is, ah, it's heartbreaking. It absolutely is. Okay, so the themes are, yeah, the eco-anxiety, it's the students, um, it's the fact that they are having uh, difficulty coming to terms with the, the news that they're hearing out there. Absolutely, that is something that teachers have let me know that that is a stumbling block for them. So the curriculum connections, don't get me started. Uh, the ministry not having <laughs> enough climate change uh, topics and goals and throughout the curriculum. And we're not the only ones. There's now been research done across Canada on, on that sort of thing. And including in teacher's college, right? Including in uh, teacher education programs, the fact that there is not a mandate to have teachers that will be entering our schools have any information about environmental and sustainability education. Um, the focusing on positive things, absolutely. And we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the fact that you don't just talk about the doom and gloom and leave it, but you have to leave the students with some sort of empowering uh, solutionary kind of, kind of thing. Okay, so those are some good themes. Okay, so you can understand how that works. And I, in case it didn't work, I always have my next slide. This would be what, what you would see in the classroom. But um, so we, we have similar themes here, that eco-anxiety, um, the, the connections to the curriculum and lack of support, there's no resources and that sort of thing. So those are themes that come across and there's been a number of research studies done on the fact that this is a big stumbling block for teachers, a lot of the things that you're talking about here today. Okay, so moving on to another provocation idea for inquiry one that we took from this chapter, we chose to include a number of interesting and also very short videos. So the longest video listed here is only four minutes long. And these can be used as a hook to pique students interest and get the student conversation flowing. Or depending on your intent, you can choose just one video or, or choose to include more in your classroom. Uh, but for the purpose of today's workshop, we would like to show you a brief clip. Um, actually, we're going to probably we have time to show the whole uh, video, which is like, Aaron. Uh, the last video here, which is called Offbeat by Eliza Schiff. And she is a slam poet finalist that was part of a youth arts program about the climate crisis. And uh, pay close attention to her delivery and the lyrics because we're going to do a, a, an activity based on this video after. So let me just share my screen here. Oh, good. I see Sydney loves slam poetry. Well, you're going to love this one and you're going to want to listen to it more than once. <laughs> yeah, for sure. My name is Eliza Schiff and this is a poem I wrote called Off Beat. I didn't know wind could scream. I'd heard it whisper, coo, call out to the world, even cry, but never in all of its ever presence did I hear it scream. Not until the sky was green and stale, as if the blue that I knew, like the creases in my mother's eyes or the twirl of my brother's hair, had never painted the sky above and I had never stared up at it, lost. The wind screamed and power lines broke, branches broke, windows broke, the stillness I knew of the night broke, and I thought for a time maybe I broke too. 
I wanted to see it, to look out of the window and watch as rain fell or maybe rain took, to look out and brace the storm sung by satellites and weather balloons and Channel 4 that sent us undercover, left us wrecked, crying out to our earthly mother, fallible and delicate and defeated, just like Hannibal. This waiting has made an Icarus out of animals. I've heard it said that a band played along as the Titanic went down, a sad and mournful tune as hope ran aground. Now our ship is sinking, our world is burning, our cities languish as they gasp for breath, but who is dancing to this melody? Is it you who sits behind a desk holding back the remedy? You idols of an older generation in an office with the windows drawn shut? Is that why you can't hear the wind screaming? Or maybe it's that you won't hear the wind screaming. But me, we, us, we have grown weary of this worn out beat, this wreckage waltz. If forever could be measured by the meter of your music, and if your music was the ricochet of they will fix it some other day, or the piercing cacophony of DC and BP and CFO and tired greed. You're counting in fours and we can't stomach it anymore. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It's the sound of drilling and dumping and filling and pumping CO2 into the atmosphere that promised us the air we breathe. It's the sound of storm surges clawing at the only home we've ever known, the neglect of a planet whose life you bemoan. This is the silence of an action that has left us weeping in vain. Not the absence of noise, but the screaming quiet of climate silence, quiet compliance. But hear us now. Our beat is not like that of the past. Congregated and aggravated and syncopated, we're dancing to the tune of resolve at last. And it sounds like you and me and us and now, and you and me and us and now, and you and me and us and now. So powerful, that video. Yes. And uh, we used to only show half in, in because of time. And we realized that we were not allowing people to understand the title of it, Offbeat, right? The, the uh, I just love the sentence, the screaming silence of climate science. Like there's just so much in there. Anyway, we are going to let you uh, take a little look at um, this video and do an activity on it. So let me see if I can pull up. All right, so the activity, is a cute chart. And some of you might know about it, some of you might not. And if you haven't used one, I think it's a really great tool because what we're trying to do in a lot of these activities is to increase critical thinking, to kind of go from that low, low first order level and try to help students, not just ask them to do it and expect them to do, but help them understand how to do it. And that's with this kind of matrix. So there's, there's it's kind of like sentence starters, except for you can do different quadrants. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with putting things in the first quadrant, which is the remembering and understanding. Um, but it is nice to know that there is a range of different kinds of questions. And ultimately you do want uh, students to get to some of the questions being in the green boxes as well. So if you go back and Jen, I think we had some people join us. You might have to paste the URL for the uh, shared Google slide deck again into the chat um, for newcomers and go to the slide that looks like this cute chart. And if you could create a question, let's see what I have here. Nope, not yet. Um, create a question on Eliza's video um, that uh, you use the, the different quadrants here. So like the what could or the which can or the who will. So see what you come up with. And let's, let's take a look at the questions that are generated, not only um, with the content, but the delivery and the choice and the person, anything goes when it comes to asking questions about this video. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Wow, this is great. I have learned to be silent. It's hard <laughs> as an educator and teacher, but I found that if I am very quiet, people can think and these get filled out remarkably well. So I love what you're coming up with. I love that you've picked up the challenge. There's a lot of, lot of uh, questions coming into the green, but it's important also to have, have them all over. So. What is Eliza's goal with this video? What can we do to help make change? Where would this poem perhaps not be welcome? What will we commit to? Oh, this is great. These are like the action 
Why did this poet create this spoken word poem? Was it created verbally or in writing? Why is there this? Because this is great. How can we as educators help students with the same emotions exactly? So one of the reasons we did chose this one is because when we do this webinar and we, we do it for high school teachers, um, we show them that this can be an activity that can be used the way we're using it, but it can also be used as an activity where they ask their students to create some slam poetry or um, some sort of, uh, some people call them rants or blogs or whatever. So the, the fact that the student is of high school age is sometimes a motivator for other high school students to also, also participate. So why is Eliza, why did, uh, yeah, Eliza compare our world to a sinking ship? I know, awesome. All right, so if you want, you can continue just to type a few things in there. Um, you are welcome at the very end of the presentations to go file a copy or file download. This is a completely um, shared Google slide deck. And if you want to use some of the ideas that you learned today and take it back with you and use however you wish, this is absolutely open for you to use. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next thing. Okay, so we're going to move on to knowledge building as the third phase of the inquiry process in our guide. And I'm going to take you through something called the six thinking hats. So some of you might have already heard about it. It's uh, from Edward de Bono's uh, collection of critical thinking activities. And I really like this because it forces students to look at a question with many different lenses. And so it's got the typical yellow hat, which is the positives and the black hat, which is the negatives um, and the white hat, which is the facts. But the blue hat goes a bit deeper into your thinking because it talks about uh, the big picture, where are we now, where we need to go next. And I love the green hat and the red hat. So the green hat is all about creativity. So think outside the box. What, what new ideas are possible? How can things can be changed or improved? And especially with climate change, as we were saying, emotions are essential and they need to be able to be expressed in a safe environment. And so the red hat talks about feelings and intuitions and hunches. Okay, so this is what we're gonna use. And here's the question. We, we chose this question with deliberation and we'll talk about it at the end. But the question is, should reducing red meat consumption be taught in schools as a high impact climate action? And so you'll see on the shared Google slide deck that I have uh, slides designated to all of the different colors of hats. And I have suggestions here for you. So we kind of get a bit of a range. If your last name is A to H, start with the yellow and blue hats, I to Q, white and green hats. And if your last name is between R and Z, start with the black and red hats. Having said that, there's no hat police here. And if you have one that you really are passionate about, one of the hats that you wanna try out, go for it and start there. But let's see what kinds of different lenses you use to answer the question about should reducing red meat consumption be taught in schools as a high impact climate action. All right, so go to your slide and let's see, let's see what you come up with. So Jen, our strategy is working. All of the colors have typing happening in them and someone I think is finally landed on the red feeling page too. So let's see what they come up with. All right, to give you another 30 seconds, but excellent job. I'm not surprised with this, with this group specifically about the fact that you've come up with some really great ideas. Um, and I found that when I do this, um, I really do appreciate students taking a look at something from another side of things. And, and for example, a lot of them originally think, yeah, no, it's a really good idea. We should just do it. And then when they start thinking about it or reading responses from other students, they understand the fact that, well, hang on, um, maybe it's not such a good idea in my community or I have to do something differently because I live somewhere where there are a lot of parents of students that work in the agricultural sector. And so you have to be careful about how you would approach this, this kind of topic. And then other people start talking about things like, oh, well, um, red meat, sometimes it's, it's uh, something that is very cheap to purchase at some of the fast food restaurants, and that is what my budget is allowing, so I can't necessarily buy all those really expensive, uh, high quality fruits and vegetables as much. So there's that kind of thing that, that happens as well when you talk about the red meat consumption. And I love how some of you have talked about um, the fact that um, you need more information. Uh, we specifically said, should it be taught in schools as a high impact climate action? Well, is it really a high impact climate action? 
do you know? Some of you probably do know, and some of you might not know. So you want to go deep, deeper in finding out are there other climate actions that might be better taught as high impact climate actions? Um, and yes, it's like, why did we target red meat? What, what about what about white meat? What about um, fish? What about other types of other types of things? And um, are the pulses, the legumes and the beans and the, the chickpeas and whatnot, are they maybe taking up a lot of our resources when it comes to water? Um, so it's it's a multifaceted topic. It sounds pretty easy, pretty pretty black and white. So just the black and white hats when you when you start, and then you start realizing that when you do this kind of activity. And I really really appreciate you guys taking this um, with such expertise and such passion and coming up with with all of these different ideas on all the different hats. I'm gonna go to the red one. Yeah, people, this is why people feel very protective of what they like to eat or not eat. So you might get some pushback. And somebody mentioned in the stickies back that there's the there's a the parental component as well, as I mentioned already, that you have to have to think about as well. So all right. So finish typing in what it is you want to type in. As I said, some people will, will download this and they'll keep the responses and you can also download it and save it as a copy and then just make it blank and, and use it again. But really appreciate uh, the, the high level answers you've given to this activity. Thank you. All right, so we're on to the fourth of the six stages of the inquiry learning that uh, we're taking you through in this guide. And there's a lot of different things that you can do when it comes to determining understanding. And a lot of you've heard of KWL um, and you might have heard of concept mapping, or I was thinking there's others and all of these that you see here, if you're not familiar with them, Jen's gonna talk about it at the end about where you can find all the 40 plus active learning strategies, just as a list that you can use at any time in your, in your teaching. I'm gonna focus here on consequence mapping because once again, I think it gets deeper. So we're gonna talk about um, consequence mapping and to kind of, pro <laughs> I go back to a provocation to kind of set the stage for this activity. But it's all about consequences. And I, if you haven't seen this cartoon, it, it went viral a number of years ago. And I thought it'd be nice to share with you. The person in the audience says with indignation, well, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? And that's sometimes how I feel when I have to talk to climate deniers. <laughs> um, I just wish I could just hold up this, this, this cartoon and go, yeah, it'd be really bad if we, uh, if we created a better world for nothing and we reduce the amount of pollution going into the the closed ecosystem that is called Earth. Anyway, so just to set the stage, so consequence mapping is often shown to you like this as a map on a piece of paper, and you can enter it at many different points and you can see how it maps around. And it requires students to go past just the first primary level of consequence and go deeper and deeper and think about interrelationships and the cause and effect. So this is great to use if you're in person and you just wanna give them the one page map. I found that when I do this as an online activity, I have uh, changed it slightly so that it's more of a linear kind of uh, activity. And you can type in your primary, secondary, tertiary consequence, and you can choose from a number of different consequences as you wish. So I'm looking at the time here. So Hillary, do we have a hard stop at uh, five o'clock? Is that right? And do you have things you need to do before then as well? Or do we get, what, how, what time should we be ending? Uh, if you folks can aim to end at about 4.57, that would be fantastic. Okay, so here's my thinking then. Um, I'm looking at the number of participants and usually I do like to do a breakout room, but I have a, we, have, we have a small number of people today. So I'm thinking we might just skip the breakout rooms tonight. Uh, we often lose people too when we do breakout rooms. People don't have their hair done or whatnot. So we're gonna not do this as a breakout room, but we're just gonna do it as a, another little activity. So you'll see that there's slides. How many did I give here? Yeah, so slide 16, 17, and 18. So if you're the first third of the alphabet, uh, type in a primary secondary consequence on slide 16. If you're in the middle of the alphabet with your last name, go to slide 17. And if you're at the end, go to slide 18. And we won't spend much time on this. Um, I just do find that when I do these presentations that if you've actually had a chance to go and try it um, and see how it works, educators are much more likely to go back and feel confident to use it in their classroom. So we'll give you just a couple minutes to try to try to figure this piece of things out. Um, and I'll stop talking now for a few minutes here. And once again, we have a bunch of smart educators with us because the primary consequences we know and we've seen them again this week with what's happening in Vancouver, it's just devastating and heartbreaking. I can't believe that Vancouver is cut off 
Um, so we're talking about, you know, the flooding, we're talking about the wildfires, we're talking about extreme weather events, many different things. Um, but then if you dig deeper and deeper, you do finally end up with this, as some people have already shown in their responses, this unequal impact on low socioeconomic communities, marginalized in the world. So, and we know that across, across the globe, that there are countries that are not contributing to climate change in a very dramatic way, but they are being impacted by climate change in a very dramatic way. So that's kind of where we would want the students to get to. Yep, they can probably come up with a primary. Now, if you have uh, students of different ages, this activity can definitely be tailored to the younger grades by, by having some sort of prompts and then having some sort of support and some mentoring. We're even having some sort of, um, if the students are of reading age, you'd already have some uh, literature out there for them to take a look at so that you would help them understand, okay, this is the primary consequence, but read this and tell me what you think is also happening. So it can be scaled up and scaled down depending on the level and age of the students that you have. Look at that, you guys have got some great things. Yeah, and the health and wellness impact on humans too is, is often something that people don't go to directly. So definitely a tertiary consequence there. Yeah, and the, uh, the food scarcity, that's, this is gonna be an interesting thing. We're already seeing incre increased prices in foods already. Um, so that's another, another thing that is definitely a tertiary consequence. It's sometimes interesting because some people start with food scarcity as a primary consequence and they go even deeper in. So if you've got students of an older age group, they might even be able to go into like um, the sixth consequence that is there. All right. So you can finish typing up and we're just going to move along here. Okay, so now I'm just going to walk you through the next two increased stages, which are uh, pursuing learning consolidation. So we call uh, pursuing learning a, the stage, and this is where you can delve into some more hands-on activities with your students. So as is the case with many of the other sections, teachers and students can kind of choose their own adventure in this guide and in this section. So for example, in inquiry one, there are three different experiential activities that focus on developing foundational science concepts, such as counting Smarties to compare weather and climate, or using a macro model experiential game that sim simulates the greenhouse effect, or graphing carbon dioxide trends using data from the Menuelao Observatory. And then in the final stage of the inquiry, the consolidation section, there are different options as well. So for example, journal prompts that you can choose to use with your students, or you can use some visual um, visuals like these visual climber cards. And I think GG cards, there, there are similar uh, options there, which are essentially a deck of visual images that can be used to help students conceptualize learning. The guide also gives an option to do a mental health check in with your students depending on feelings and reactions that have surfaced throughout uh, this inquiry. And these are woven throughout each, um, some of the different chapters within the guide. These uh, mental health activities could include taking your class outside for a nature break or researching positive climate action outcomes, uh, different things like that. So as we said, we've got the, uh the core of the guide, which is the six inquiry steps. But we also at the beginning front loaded it with teacher information. And we also tag on at the end an assessment strategy. So we took a look at the guide and we realized assessment is so often missing and teachers aren't aware of strategies for assessment that aren't the typical quiz or pen and paper activities. You can do a lot of active learning assessment strategies. And so these are some of the ones that we've included in the guide. Um, that you can take a look at. And I'm just gonna quickly show you the raft strategy in case you aren't aware of it. So it's a really nice strategy because it gives a lot of choice to the student and they get to choose their role, the audience, the format and the topic. So this type of thing can be uh, put up and the teacher can choose what they wanna put underneath into each category. And then the student, here's an example of what they might've chosen. Let's say the student wants, wants to feel very clever and they want to be the scientist and then they get frightened and they don't want to, they don't want to do it too high level. So they want to be a scientist for the general public. And there's they're not really good at writing, they hate it. So they're gonna do a video um, and they have chosen, or you have chosen as the teacher that they're going to do this activity on five health effects of climate change. And you can use the same assessment uh, tool, assessment rubric to, uh, to mark this because you're marking for the content and, and the, 
whether or not they've understood the concepts. So just one sample of something that you can do that gives students a lot of choice. So each of the eight inquiries culminates with taking action. So allowing students time to take action is an essential part of the learning process on climate change as it empowers students and can help to ease eco-anxiety. So as Diane Sachs, the former environmental commissioner of Ontario says in most of her presentations, when students are given knowledge and then allowed to take action, this is what inspires hope. And we have heard from so many students that classroom learning is all about climate science and then being overwhelmed by all the doom and gloom so not enough time is dedicated towards the solutions to climate change and what students can do in their classroom to make a difference. So in this guide to help uh, teachers with the process of taking action, there not only is there a taking action, action section at the end of each chapter, but there's an entire uh, chapter dedicated to taking action and the six steps that you see listed at the bottom of the slide here. And the taking action section at the end of each chapter is broken down kind of into two different parts. So general ideas for what you could do uh, to take action in the classroom, and then some specific uh, action project examples from across Canada that have taken place to kind of inspire students or uh, give real life examples of what can happen in schools. Uh, for instance, in chapter one, you can see creating posters, blog posts, highlighting local risks or adaptations, making a class pledge, launching a survey, et cetera. And then some specific examples on the right hand side here of projects that have taken place um, across Canada. So there are many creative ways that students can follow their passion and you will find out more ideas um, um, if you explore the guide further. <laughs> So thanks, Jen. And yes, and we want to uh, follow the same protocol that we uh, we put in the guide and we want just to kind of finish and summarize our presentation with you by having you partake for the last time in the shared Google slide deck and doing a taking action step. So we just want you to, you know how you, you go to these wonderful, wonderful webinars and professional development sessions and you're all, yep, I'm going to do this. And then you just forget it as soon as you get home because some something hits. So let's write a pledge, let's write it down. What knowledge or skill or strategy from this workshop has inspired you to enhance your teaching practice? So basically you're just going to take a pledge and you're gonna write down based on my learning from this session, this is what I'd like to do. And it can be huge and holistic. It can be a specific micrograin strategy that you just heard about today that you're really interested in diving deeper. And it can be as general as, oh my gosh, I better start start getting onto the internet and clicking on this guide and seeing what else I need to, I, I can I can get from, from all the different resources presented. And so as you do that, I'm just gonna, I like poor Greta. Um, she is, I remember I knew her before she was famous and I followed her all that way. Um, and so I loved her quote that she tweeted out, uh, this is in 2018. So when we start to act, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, look for action, then the hope will come. So she said that a number of years ago in 2018. Um, and I just, I just feel that this sort of summarizes this activity beautifully. We've got wonderfully fast typers here. So they're talking about the consequence mapping, oh good, yep. Yes, and the active learning strategies inquiry needs to be a bigger focus. Hillary, I'm actually writing a chapter, if I was invited to write a chapter for a book, and it's all about how transformative pedagogies need to be implemented in teacher preparation programs. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to be sharing some of these strategies in that, in that chapter, and I've been doing some research about how teacher preparation programs are really, across the globe, are really not embracing transformative strategies. They don't even embrace having the content of climate change in the programs yet. So I know that's something that's near and dear to your heart. So true, Karen. I think, you know, we need to model that, that which we want new teachers to um, enact in their own teaching. And so, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, and the Drawdown Project. Uh, what a great resource that is. And Jen was the one that talked about that on her page. But if you want to have like a hundred strategies that are being used in the world, I have the hard copy book when it first came out, but they were so generous. They put all of the strategies online uh, for free. Um, so that's the Drawdown Project in case you hadn't seen that. All right. Karen and Jen, this has been just absolutely amazing. Um, I think you're gonna pop into the chat a link to a survey for people to provide feedback um, on what you've done today. Um, and so I encourage people to, to absolutely do that. Jen, are you okay to pop that link into the chat?
Yeah, and I'll just make, uh, say a quick caveat. So we're going to post two links. The first one is just feedback for us on this presentation and um, some questions for you, with which you will uh, get an email if you fill it out to all the resources that we provided tonight. And then just quickly, the slide that Karen has up here now is a link also to LSF's climate change, uh, National Climate Change Survey. So uh, having the, the audience that we do have here tonight, we would really encourage you to take, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to fill out and uh, is going to be the next, uh, you know, big benchmark for hopefully, uh, you know, programs and influencing curriculum and, and uh, will inform so many of the things that we do at LSF and hopefully elsewhere. So we'd love to get your perspective. So I'll post two links in the chat right now. Yeah, it was confusing because Jen asked me about surveys too, and I got the two mixed up. But this this is the survey. I'll just link it back to the very beginning. Remember I said there was a survey that went out that caused the creation of this guide? Well, this was the survey. It came out in 2019, I believe. And so now in 2021, the survey is being redone. And we want to see if there's been any shift in educators' understanding and teaching of climate change. And I've had the pleasure of being uh, doing some some work with Ellen Field uh, in recent months, who was one of the co-authors on that study. Um, I was actually just on a panel with her last night, and um, you know, it that that study has been really important. I have to say, in terms of getting conversations started, in because the data is Canadian, uh, and we don't often have that data to support the Canadian experience when it comes to climate change education uh, and where people's understandings are at about the climate crisis. So. Um, Happy to, uh, to, through my network, share the link to that survey and to um, encourage others to do the same. Yeah, send it out, send it forward, send it to all your friends. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jen and Karen, can I extend a, a huge warm thank you today? Uh, I love that you have not just told us about how to take an inquiry process here of learning, but you've actually led us through that, which is really important. Uh, that modeling is key. I love what you've done with the Jamboards here. I think it's a really great use of Jamboards to, um, really to embed interactivity, uh, not only into a webinar, but also uh, modeling that for our classrooms too. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise and sharing the work that you're doing in this area. And I know that people will look forward to um, uh, pulling down the guide and, uh, and taking a very careful look at it. I, I think this has been a great little taster in many ways to um, introduce us to what's in the guide and to really encourage us to take a, a much deeper dive into it, which is fantastic. Um, I just wanna point out to people um, that we have got a couple more workshops coming down the pipe um, and also a follow up on the conference for those of you who attended the conference a couple of weeks ago that um, the recordings will be available over the next few days. And we will send out the link if you are registered for the conference, we'll send out that link to everybody. Um, but if you haven't, then just do a little quick screen snap and you'll be able to find the recordings from the conference um, on our webpage uh, that we uh, have on the OISE site, but it is uh, shared with the TBSB as well. And our thanks go to Chris Metropolis, who's in the room for doing all of the amazing video editing on those and doing it so quickly. Thank you, Chris. We really appreciate your hard work on that front. And um, uh, can I also uh, encourage you to come join us for a talk by Catherine O'Brien, who's talking about sustainable happiness. This is an unusual lunchtime talk because it's done in combination with Oise Wellness. Uh, that's coming up next week. And then on December 8th, our last one of the season, Will, uh, Karen, you mentioned that the TDSB uh, has been in process for a little while on their own um, youth guide for climate action in the TDSB. And they'll be doing that launch of their guide on December 8th. So I encourage everybody to join us uh, for those upcoming events. So thank you to all of you for uh, joining us today. I'm just going to um, pop the feedback poll up for um, for those who might like to uh, complete it and just give us a little bit of feedback on, on uh, your experience of today's uh, webinar. So thank you, everybody. And please stay in the room if you'd like to ask Jen and Karen any more questions. Yeah, well, we're happy to hang out for people that have a question or two for us. I don't mind. I don't mind waiting to see.